Spring Quarter, Jesus Calls Us, Unit 1, Called from the Margins of Society. A child is greatest in the kingdom. Our lesson today comes from Matthew chapter 18, verses 1 through 9 from the Message Bible. At about the same time, the disciples came to Jesus asking, Who gets the highest rank in God's kingdom? For an answer, Jesus called over a child, whom he stood in the middle of the room and said, I'm telling you once and for all that unless you return to square one and start over like children, you're not even going to get a look at the kingdom, let alone get in. Whoever becomes simple and elemental again, like this child, will rank high in God's kingdom. What's more, when you receive the childlike on my account, it's the same as receiving me. But if you give them a hard time bullying or taking advantage of their simple trust, you'll soon wish you hadn't. You'd be better off dropped in the middle of the lake with a millstone around your neck doom to the world for giving these God-believing children a hard time. Hard times are inevitable, but you don't have to make it worse. And it's doomsday to you if you do. If your hand or your foot gets in the way of God, chop it off and throw it away. You're better off maimed or lame and a lie than the proud owners of two hands and two feet, godless in a furnace of eternal fire. And if your eye distracts you from God, pull it out and throw it away. You're better off one eye and a lie than exercising your 2020 vision from inside the fire of hell you know that the passage in our lesson today can be viewed as an inactive parable for Jesus begins by placing a child among them. That's in verse 2. In the next chapter, Jesus will also go on to welcome the little children. That's in chapter 19 verses 13 and through 15. That while we may tend to idolize childhood today, in ancient times, children were held as having very little essential value. Their worth lay in their potential as future contributors, and the church should remember that children have high value now, not just as the future of the church. That the phrase to become like a child does not suggest that we should become naive or innocent. Rather, by encouraging his disciples to emulate one who was not deemed to hold social status, Jesus is encouraging us to relinquish claims of power and dominion over others. Therefore, Jesus singles out humility as the characteristic to emulate. And you'll find that in verse four. This type of reversal of social status is frequent in the gospel tradition. The lowly are raised up. Luke chapter one, verse 52. The poor will be blessed. Luke chapter six, verse 20. And the last will be first. Matthew chapter 20, verse 16. This is a challenge to the church today to reach out to the marginalized of society and to affirm the value of those on the margins of society. Jesus not only urged his followers to become like children, but he also threatened those who hold power over the little ones by pointing out the severe consequences of abusing that power. That Jesus is not urging literal amputation 
or self-mutilation in verses 8 and 9. Rather, he is using vivid imagery to challenge his listeners to remove the sources of sin and corruption in their lives. Our historical biblical background. A note of interest. Many biblical scholars agree that the Gospel of Matthews of Matthew is difficult to date, and there are several factors that have inspired some scholars to consider a date ranging between AD 50 and AD 100. The first factor relates to the destruction of the temple, which occurred in AD 70, and the fact that there is no mention in this gospel of the catastrophic event suggests that the Gospel of Matthew was written before the event occurred. Second, the mostly Jewish nature of Matthew suggests that it was written at a time when much of the evangelizing in which Christians partook was directed exclusively to the Jews and became less common as time passed. The third factor relates to the writing of the Gospel of Mark, which many scholars believe was the first gospel composed, thus making it likely that Matthew was written soon after. If the Gospel of Mark was written first, then it stands to reason that the Gospel of Matthew must have a later date and vice versa. Nevertheless, most scholars accept the hypothesis that both Matthew and Luke used Mark as source materials and the composition of the book of Matthew was completed somewhere between AD 50 and AD 100. Matthew is considered to be the most Jewish-centric book of the four Gospels because its author regularly called upon the writings of the Old Testament prophets to affirm Jesus' identity as Israel's long-awaited Messiah. Biblical scholars suggest that the main purpose of Matthew's book was to record the life and teachings of Jesus and to show the Jews that Jesus of Nazareth was the expected Messiah. Another note of interest. The Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke were all written approximately one generation after Jesus' death and resurrection, which makes it significant because Matthew was a primary source for Jesus' life and ministry, and as one of Jesus' disciples, Matthew was present for the events he described, therefore making his record carry a high degree of historical consistency and reliability. Many biblical scholars agree that the atmosphere and so and the atmosphere and society in which Matthew wrote his gospel was extremely complex from a political and religious standpoint. And although Christianity grew quickly after the death and resurrection of Jesus, the church was just beginning to spread beyond Jerusalem when Matthew wrote his gospel. Historians also remind us that Christians were beginning to experience persecution from the Roman Empire during the time Matthew wrote his gospel. Another fact related to Matthew's writing is that he recorded the narrative of Jesus' life during the time when a small number of people had been alive to hear Jesus' teachings or witness his miracles. You may have heard the acronym GOAT, G-O-A-T, meaning greatest of all time, used in reference to various sports personalities. The question then is, what does it take? to be great. What are the personality ingredients that culminate to produce greatness? What standards do people use to determine who is great and who is not great? It is important to note 
that public recognition and its definition of greatness are always changing. As a matter of fact, why is greatness only defined by comparing two great individuals and determining which one is less great? One observer suggested that people do not consider a person to be great until thousands of people know the person by first name only or until the individual is on top of the music charts, the topic of conversation and or bathed in money, jewels, awards, and trophies. But what is really the test of true greatness Greatness in the Bible is never determined by how much money someone has or how much influence or power he or she claims to have. Greatness is always associated with the one who is a servant. And by biblical standards, our greatness is determined by our willingness to serve. When the disciples asked Jesus, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? They were surprised by his response, and although the disciples coveted places, positions, and power, Jesus had something else in mind. Our lesson takes us into one of Jesus' preeminent discourses concerning greatness, and we will discover the true test and nature of greatness. In the first two chapters of the Gospel of Matthew, the writer discusses the ancestry birth, and early life of Jesus. Beginning with chapter 3, the writer focuses on the ministry of Jesus. His ministry included a vast amount of teaching. Matthew describes those teachings as being arranged around discourses. The teaching in chapter 18 contains the fourth of five discourses in the Gospel of Matthew. The fourth discourse emphasizes the importance of humility and self-sacrifice as superior virtues within the faith community. And I've given you the website uh, for five discourses of Matthew. Another note of interest, scholars suggest that Matthew is the author of this gospel and on the website preaching source it is asserted that the only record of Matthew, aside from various lists of disciples, is found in Matthew chapter 9, verses 9 through 13, Mark chapter 2, verses 13 through 17, and Luke chapter 5, verses 27 through 32. In these writings, Matthew is called Levi, the publican or tax collector. The name Levi is Matthew's Jewish name, which was later changed to Matthew, the Greek equivalent of Theodore, meaning gift of Jehovah. Scholars do not know for certain why his name was changed from Levi to Matthew. Some suggest that the change was possibly made because Levi was too obviously a Jewish name, identifying him with the priestly tribe. His being a tax collector for Rome would have reflected unfavorably on the tribe of Levi and its priestly character. Other scholars suggest that the name change possibly carried Christian significance resulting from Matthew's call to, the, to discipleship, which was a gift from God. And I've given you the website, PreachingSource.com. Nevertheless, Matthew was called from his tax collector's booth in Capernaum in Galilee to become a follower of Jesus Christ. Matthew's education and experience equipped him perfectly for the discipleship ministry to which he was called. As a tax collector, Matthew was educated in the use of both Aramaic and Greek languages. Matthew's purpose in writing this gospel was to prove to the Jews that Jesus Christ is the promised Messiah. 
I'll lesson, the lesson, our lesson explained. First one opens by revealing how the subtlety, subtlety of the old nature's desire for power, position, and prestige comes to life. In Matthew 17, verse 22, Jesus gave the disciples a second prediction of his betrayal and subsequent death. Unfortunately, this announcement did not have a lasting effect on the disciples because their attention turned to the pursuit of power and position. The day began with the auspicious appearances of Moses and Elijah with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. And you'll find that in Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 through 8. However, only three of the disciples, Peter, James, and John, had been invited by Jesus to witness this glorious scene. In Mark's account, there is an argument among the three disciples about who would be the greatest in the kingdom. And that's in Mark chapter 9, verses 33 and 34. And after descending from the mountain, Jesus healed a demon-possessed boy and paid taxes for himself and the disciples with a coin from the mouth of a fish. You find that in Matthew chapter 17, verses 24 through 27. Perhaps the disciples pondered why the Lord of the kingdom is obligated to pay taxes of any kind. Some scholars believe that the phrase at the same time suggests that the question the disciples were about to ask Jesus took place just after he announced, had announced his death. Other scholars believe that the questions the disciples were about to ask Jesus took place after the miraculous healing of the demon-possessed boy. Nevertheless, embedded in the question the disciples asked was self-centered motivation concerning greatness, power, and prestige in God's kingdom. Verses 2 through 4 reveal that Jesus, instead of directly answering his disciples' question, he decided to give them a powerful and compelling object lesson on greatness with a little child as the subject. Just imagine the disciples' surprise and shock when Jesus called the child to him without naming any of them as the greatest. Although the King James Version refers to the male gender of the child, the word child in Greek is padion, has reference to a young boy or girl. The word set in Greek is histemi and means to stand. Jesus had the child to stand in the middle of the disciples and in using the child as an object lesson, Jesus gave the disciples a lesson they would not forget. Jesus taught them that they had to become like a child, a person of no status to enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus' answer was a radical departure from Jewish society's estimation of who is valued in society. Note, children were not considered very valuable. They were persons of no status subjected to the authority of their elders. Jesus taught that one could only belong to the kingdom of God by coming to God with a posture of humility, absent of arrogant self-sufficiency. By providing this object lesson, the disciples were challenged to change their way of thinking regarding positions of power, popularity, prestige, and influence in the kingdom of heaven. Greatness in God's kingdom is based on childlike humility of spirit, not human effort through the competing for positions of power and prestige. In verse 5, Jesus transitions from focusing on the natural to focusing on the spiritual. 
Jesus declares that there is a blessing in receiving citizens of his kingdom who humble themselves like children. Whoever receives a little child, a representative of his humble followers in his name, will be rewarded as if the person has received the Lord himself. What is done for the disciple, as represented by the child, would be considered as having been done for the master. Those who desired to be accepted by him were required to accept others who exemplify the virtue of humility. It is certainly understood that children are neither perfect nor sinless, but they possess traits that should characterize the believer's life. The truth that Jesus was sharing with his disciples is that true greatness is exemplified by accepting persons who humble themselves as children on the ground or authority of Jesus and by accepting the role of a servant and assuming the posture of true greatness means becoming humble in Christ for the glory of God. In verse 6, well, verse 6 begins with the word, but, suggesting that what Jesus is about to say was in contrast with what came before. And Jesus issued a strong warning to those who cause little ones who trust in him to stumble. The Greek verb used for the phrase to sin is scandalize, meaning to offend or cause to fall. The warning is to those in the world, but especially to believers who directly or indirectly lead others to sin. Becoming a source of temptation to sin is one way to become a stumbling block to Jesus. Jesus' little ones, refusing to forgive, making disparaging remarks, displaying denigrating attitudes, failing to defend and protect, and displaying a lack of Christian concern are additional causes. Jesus made it clear that the guilty are better off being drowned with a heavy millstone around the neck than to face God's judgment for seducing a believer to sin. In other words, it would would be better for a person to die before causing a citizen of the kingdom of God to sin. In verse 7, one of the inevitable experiences of life is the constant temptation to sin and the barrage of stumbling blocks presented by the world. The word offenses in Greek is skandalon and speaks of people, places, or things that trip people up and trap them in a vicious cycle of sin. The world provides innumerable allurements that tempt persons to sin because believers are in the world. Believers will never be free from the temptation of sin. However, Believers must not be guilty of tempting others to sin because individuals who tempt others to sin will experience the judgment of God in profound ways. The word woe in Greek is away and is an interjection that speaks of indignation or grief. Jesus issued a strong message to the disciples to not allow the scribes and Pharisees to cause them to stumble. And it is a strong message to believers today to not follow the wrong people. In verses 8 and 9, Jesus utilizes the hyperbole, utilizes hyperbole 
to demonstrate the seriousness of causing others to sin. The word cometh is a present tense verb and speaks of something or someone who continues to effect sin in an individual's life. It is important to note that Jesus was not pushing self-mutilization when he suggests it to cut off members of the body that may be offensive. The point that Jesus was making is that sin must be dealt with instantly, radically and completely because of its destructive effects. In essence, Jesus is suggesting that we perform spiritual surgery by consciously acknowledging, confessing, and forsaking sin in our lives to prevent causing others to stumble. As members of the faith community, we are challenged to apply Jesus' warning about sin's effects and the importance of dealing with it among our members in intentional ways. We are to dismantle the barrier of self-righteousness and eliminate spiritual snobbery and exclusivity. What should become evident in the faith community is a spirit of genuine humility exemplified in our relationship through forgiveness acceptance, and restoration. Some concluding thoughts. Children are cherished resources with innate qualities and values that often go unappreciated by the larger society. What impedes our ability to be more childlike? Jesus recognized qualities in children that most resemble God's definition of greatness and challenge disciples to relinquish their claims to power or greatness. One of the age-old problems in modern society is understanding and accepting the characteristics of true greatness. Some suggest that greatness is measured by aggressiveness and the ability to show alpha strength. Jesus, however, taught a completely different view of greatness. Instead of pride, he emphasized humility. Instead of aggressiveness, he emphasized childlikeness. Instead of disorder, he emphasized self-control. True greatness is determined by one's willingness to humble himself or herself and display a spirit of meekness as he or she participates in the mission of God. Are you humble like a child? Let us pray. Father, we find ourselves sometimes at the disposal of the challenges and problems of life. Heavenly Father, help us to have the humility of a child as we seek to maneuver through these challenges and transform our hearts and minds so that we will continue to seek the kind of greatness that is required in your kingdom. Orient our hearts toward the actions and habits that mark us as citizens of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.